Let's talk about forms. I'm going to start a number of videos and I want to I want to go through and look at how users enter data into web pages. So the way that we pass in things like login details or when we're purchasing items from a store or any any time you're trying to pass data back to a website, what you're going to do is you're going to do it in the context of an HTML5 form. So for a couple weeks, we're going to spend our time looking at how do we build these forms, how do we style them, how do we make sure that the data is valid. So when a user puts in information, how do we make sure it doesn't break our database or that it isn't in a format that we can't use, those sorts of things. So I'm going to go through a number of examples and show you how to do this. And what, what I thought I would do today is I would start in on the notes for week 10. And I'll talk a little bit about these notes, but I'll leave you to read them on your own. And what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to show you some live examples. So I think there is no better way to learn the web than to go and look at lots and lots of existing web pages and tear them apart and understand how they work. So I'll show you how we code these forms up. I've got um, a code editor here and a web page where I can do a little bit of work. So I'll try um, writing a little bit of this code too so you can see, we'll, we'll come at it a number of ways. So there's some great readings this week from Google and um, on the Mozilla Developer Network for how do you create forms. And I, I would highly recommend going through and looking at all these really great site here. Smash a Magazine did a really good article on uh, some of the CSS aspects of it. Google has an excellent uh, fundamentals page on how to create forms, some good videos, and um, just lots and lots of tips. Doing forms well is something that um, a lot of people don't do. It's easy to make a form, but it's not easy to make a form that's usable. And that's one. Of, that's going to be one of our goals is to try and make our forms work as best as we can make them for our users. And we're going to think about users who are using all kinds of devices, users with different accessibility needs, etc. So Anyway, let's let's jump into it. Okay, so when we're talking about a form, what we really mean first and foremost is that we're using this form element. So you can think of a form as a container and what it allows us to do, it, in some ways it's you could think of it like it's a div or some other kind of a, an element that has children in it, but we're gonna use a special set of children in here. We're gonna use input elements and other form-based fields to be able to uh, create our forms. So, you know, making a form in your in your document is as simple as adding a form to your page. And if I add a form to my page, you can see that it's not going to do anything. Like there's a form in that page, but it doesn't have anything that you can interact with yet. So the form is a way for us to group a bunch of fields together that we want to be able to process. And by processing, I mean we might want to send it to a server in order to, to do something. So one of the first things that you're going to do when you create a form is you're going to say, all this data that I'm about to create, I want to be able to, I want to be able to send it somewhere. So I want to be able to send it to a particular URL. So for example, I might have a search page and I want the user to be able to enter a bunch of data. And when they're done, I want this data to go to our search page. This could also be, another URL. It could be a URL somewhere else that you want to send this data. But often what you're going to find is people are going to send it to another uh, another page or another route, another endpoint, as we say, on the same server. So that's what the action of a form is. The action says, when I submit this, where do I submit this? Okay, so this is a URL. And we also specify one more thing, or we usually do on our forms, and that is we specify the method. How are we going to submit this? And when we say method, we mean an HTTP method, like which of the verbs for submitting this are we going to do? So one possibility is we can do a HTTP get. And I'll, I'm going to show you examples of both of these and talk about why you would do the different types. But uh, we can specify that we want to do a get, or we could say, I want to do a post. And both of those methods will allow us to send data to the server, but they have 
they have different, there's different reasons why I would use one over the other. So let's just, let's talk about these for a second. So if you see a form and the form looks like this, it means that by default, so we'll just throw this in here, uh, default method is get. It means that we're gonna send our data using an HTTP get. And when you think about get, what get really means is that you're gonna put all of your data on the URL. So when you have a query string, that's what this is here, we have a query string, and we're gonna put all of our values. So we're gonna have a name equals value, and we're gonna pass in data like this, and we're gonna separate multiple values, name two equals value two, etc. We're gonna separate them out like so. So you, you've seen lots and lots of URLs that work this way, I'm sure, and I'm gonna show you some examples of them, where they have a long chain of name value pairs that are put on the URL. And so when we do a get uh, method equals get, that's what we're saying. We wanna put all of this data onto the URL. So there's some, Nice qualities to this. I mean, one thing is it's easy to see your data. Your data is on the URL and you could make modifications to it. You can see what's being submitted. There's a lot of visibility to it. So that same visibility has some downsides. We don't tend to want to put data on a URL that we can't share because what do people do with URLs? They copy and paste them. They send them to their friends in a text message or so we don't want to expose our users to the problem that they've submitted some kind of data and the data has, for example, we wouldn't want to do username equals Dave and password equals whatever. Right. So now somebody copies that off of the URL and they're going to have a problem. So in that case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna move the data. We're gonna use a post method. So when you use a post, what you're gonna do is you're gonna send that data to the server, but you're gonna send it in the body of the request. So when you do, so we talk, we're here, we're talking about what happens when you do a get. The alternative is post and it will use it'll stuff all that data into the body. So in both cases, the data is transferred to the server. In one case, it happens on the URL and on the, on the query string. In the second case, it's gonna happen as an HTTP request. And the second method when we're, doing po when we're using post, it's really good for data that's got some privacy issues to it. Also for data that's, that is longer. So a URL is, is going to be limited in the length that it can support. You can't have a URL that contains uh, megabytes of data, but you can have a post which allows you to send megabytes of data up to a server. So a good example of this would be if you're submitting data that includes a file, like for example, when you submit your assignments to Blackboard, you have to upload a zip file or upload some other file. You can't, you can't put a file, well, you technically can put a file here on the URL, but the problem is you're gonna run out of room. So eventually you're gonna hit a max and you can't, the URL can't be uh, any longer than a certain length. And so we tend to deal with that by not putting long data into the URL. Instead, we put it into the body of a request. So in the notes, I actually have an example. I'll scroll down and show you what it would look like. Uh, two examples. So here is a Google search. I'm gonna show you the Google search form in a second, but you can see when you look at this URL, you can see that a whole bunch of data has been added to the end of the URL in the form of the query string. So what I have is I have a question mark followed by all of these key value pairs. So here's the first key value pair, source equals HP. And then I have another one, EI equals, and I won't read this to you, but you can see what it is. Q equals cat plus pictures, right? BTNK equals Google plus search. So what we have here is we have all the data and it's been chunked up into a, into a single string and then separated by these ampersands. And that's, what's, that's how it's being passed to Google for doing a search. 
And down a little bit further, I have an example of an HTTP request, and you can see I've, I've shortened it a little bit, but HTTP requests have two parts to them. So the top part are the headers, and you can see that you know, it has like the host name is equal to this, the content length is equal to 59, etc. And the headers end with a blank line, and then everything that comes after that is the body. And what's happened here is all of the data has been placed into the body. It still looks the same, right? It still has this same kind of what they call form encoding, where we have the ampersands and it's all been strung together. However, this can go really, really long. Like this could be a, a massive amount of data that we're submitting up to a server. So when we're talking about designing our forms, one of the things we have to figure out at the beginning is where are we going to submit this and how do we want to submit this? Do we want to submit it using a post or a get? There's one last thing I'll mention about doing your submissions and you'll sometimes come across forms that look like this. They will have an action that says I want to use this as my URL. And what that generally is used to mean is that you want to process the data in the form in the browser and you're not going to send it to a server. This is actually becoming more and more common where people want to write JavaScript and have complex applications that do everything right in the web page and they don't necessarily need to send anything to a server for additional processing. So you'll see this you'll see this come up sometimes and when you do you know that means all right I'm not going to send it to the server I'm going to I'm just going to deal with everything I'm going to deal with everything in this place here okay now I want to go and I want to show you some examples but we need to talk about one more thing before we do and that is that inside of your forms what you're going to do is you're going to put all sorts of fields where the user can enter data and one of the types of fields that we use is we use an input an input element Input element is an empty element, meaning there's no content. We don't put, we don't do that, right? So we're not going to put any, any content here. We're not going to have a closing tag. We're just going to have a single input tag like this. And then we're going to define a number of aspects of an input element in order to tell the browser how is the user supposed to interact with this. So the simplest one that we could do is we could say that we have an input and its type is equal to text, just like that. So if I save this, you'll see my form changes up here and I get a place where I can start typing text, All right? Now, as we go along, we're gonna talk about lots and lots of different types of input elements that you can use, the different properties that you can put on them, but just a couple of things to just for you to know about before we get going, because I know you've been working with lots of other input, lots of other element types. What, what does an input element let, let us do? So some of the things that we've been doing up until this point, we've been doing things like giving elements IDs, right? So we know that an ID is a unique identifier in the page. Only one element can have an ID. So for example, if I wanted to have an ID and ID is username, right? I could specify that this is the, the username. But we also have this, we have a couple of other interesting things that we can do in it with an input element. And the one is we, we have to specify a name for an input element. So for example, I might say username. And you might look at this and say, this doesn't make any sense. Why do I have an ID and a name and they both have the same name? Or sometimes you'll see something like this. Um, where the ID and the name will be different. And you look at this and think, why? Why am I having to specify these two things? So when you see an ID, the ID is this element in the DOM. So in the DOM, when the page is built and you're doing CSS or you're doing JavaScript and you want to be able to write code which can target this particular element, this input element, you're going to use an ID. But that has nothing to do with the actual form. So the fact that this input element is part of this form, what a form really is, a form is a way to do names and values, name value pairs. So I can do the same thing here. I could say value equals Dave. So you can see in my form up here that what's happened is I have an input element. It has a name 
it has a name attribute of username and the value, the current value is Dave. Well, typically I wouldn't do this because not everybody's username is Dave. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't normally put a value on this. I would normally leave the value off of this so that the user can fill in their own, their own name. But this is what a form input element is really all about. It's about taking a name and a value and putting them together. And if I wanted to put another input ID equals, um, let's say, well, let's change this. Let's make this first name, and this will be first name and last name, last name value equals like so. I'm just going to leave this off because there's no point of it. Type equals text. You can see that I now have two elements for my form. I have a place to do a first name and a place to do a last name. And so what I'm doing is I'm building up a collection, a collection of key value pairs, name value pairs that say, what, what did the user put in? So for me, you know, Dave Humphrey, like so, those are the values that I'm entering. So we're creating elements where the value can change based on user input. That's really the, the concept of what we're looking at here. Okay, so I think the easiest way to understand this is if I show you a, a bunch of live examples. So in the notes this week, I have already written up lots of examples from the past. Some of these uh, have gotten, uh, are, they've gotten a little bit older because the pages have changed. So I thought what I would do is I would just show you some examples right now of what this is like. And Probably the, the simplest one that we could start with, a really basic one, is the Seneca page itself. When you go to SenecaCollege.ca, on this page there's a couple of forms. So I'm just going to open up my inspector and we can take a look at what's going on in this page. So the first one you'll notice is right here, this search box here and there's another one that we'll talk about which is right here. What would you like to study? What's your program of study? Okay, so let's let's start with this one up here. Now, if you look at the HTML, you can see that what we've got is we have a form, and what can we already tell about this form? We can see that it has an action of search slash search.html. Well, that's an indicator to me that if I went up to my page here and I went to slash search.html, there's obviously a page there that I could go to. So if I press enter, it takes me to the search results page. And you can see that right now there are no search results because I haven't told it what to search for. It's expecting to get that data from the URL. So let's take a look at this. We have action equals search. Now you notice when you look through this, there, there's no method. Uh, so what are they using? Well, we know that if you don't specify a method, it means that you're using a get, and a get means that it's going to pass the data on the query string. Okay, so what else do we have inside here? If you look down inside the form, often when you're looking at real examples, they're going to have other things like divs and spans and so on, but let's just focus on the input control. So there's one input control right here where it says search. What do we learn when we look at this? First thing we notice is that you're supposed to enter text, type equals text, okay? And you'll notice that they've given it an ID of Q and they have a name of Q. So what that means is that I should be able to specify whatever I type in here, it's going to show up as the value of the Q parameter. That's really what this says. Now they've done one last thing and that is they've put in some placeholder text. So you'll notice up here that before I start typing anything, it, it already has the word search. So it's an indication for me that I can put text here and down here they have what would you like to study and that's the same thing. So if I click on this text box, that text is going to vanish as soon as I start typing. So it's only there as a helper to tell me, okay, here's an example of what you should put in when you're, when you're typing here. If I remove this out, it comes back again. So placeholder text is not the value, but it is temporary text that I want to put there so that the user has, we often use it as a way of, sh of saying, here's an example of what I'd like you, 
uh, to enter here. So that's what this is doing here. Let's try doing a search. So I'm going to do a search for web 222. I'm going to type this in and I'm going to either I could click on this magnifying glass or I could press the enter key. So I press the enter key and what comes back? First of all, take a look at this URL. So my URL looks like the following. I now have search slash search dot HTML and then you can see a question mark which begins my query string. And then after that, you can see all the values from the form. So in this case, it's a really simple form. There's only one thing in it, which is Q equals web 222, or I would guess query equals web 222. So what they've done is they've allowed us to search on this page. Let's, let's, try, let's try an experiment. What if I didn't use the form? So, what if I search for OOP244? Okay, that worked too. So what you're noticing here is that I can use this almost like a command line tool or I can use this as a pure text thing. The URL is a programming interface. I'm able to pass data, just like calling a function and passing arguments into a function. What I'm doing here is I'm using the URL and I'm saying I wanna pass this data in. So I want to pass in web 222. And what our form is doing on the previous page is it's giving us, if I go back, it's giving us a way to type this stuff in without having to mess around with the URL. Because if I had lots of things to enter, it would be complicated. So I type web 222 and I come here and now I get all of these search results. So all of the different pages that it's found when it's done its search. So this is really interesting. I have very simple form. It's, it's only passing one piece of data. You'll notice that the data is really short. So it, it's fine in this case for us to put it in the URL. I'm not passing in megabytes of data that have to get, I'm not like uploading an image or something like that. I'm just typing in uh, a couple of characters and it's able to process that and, and work with it. So if we go back here, we've got another one down here. Find a program. What would you like to study? Let's say computers. So I do a program search. Sorry, no programs match your results. So that's interesting. I wonder what I have to put in. Programming, find a... Yeah, so CPA comes up as an example. So same kind of thing is happening here. So if we go back and look at this form, before we even do, take a look at the URL. You can see that it has keywords equals programming right after program search.html. So my guess is if I was going to write this form, probably what we're going to see, let's try and translate this into, um, so we would have action equals program search.html. And we would say that the default method is equal to get. And now how would they do, how would they do this? Well, we need a way to enter in keywords. Keywords, the name of the field is gonna be keywords and it's gonna be text. So if I was gonna design a form for being able to do this, I might design it something like this, okay? Let's see how close we are. So if I go back to the page that we were just on and we take a look, find a program. If I inspect this here, let's see what we have. So form action equals program slash program search, right? So I miss the uh, slash programs directory, but there we go. So programs, program search.html. And you can see that inside there, we have an input type equals text, yep. ID equals Q, that's interesting. Name equals keyword. So you can see here's a good example where the ID and the name don't match and that's 100% fine, they don't need to match. And we can see placeholder equals, um, what would you like to study? So that's where this text here is coming from. So I could do the same thing on mine. I could say uh, placeholder equals, what would you like to study? And I save this and you can see that my form looks like this. What would you like to study? Similar. Now, I'm not doing any CSS on my form. So all of these forms are going to look different than mine or better because we're just doing uh, the basics without adding any kind of styling. And, 
adding the styling is one of the things we're going to be doing as we go forward. Okay, so this is good. So let's go explore some other forms. So this was a pretty basic form. Let's add another level of complexity to it. Okay, so here's a form that I know you've all used and I use it every day. And this is where we do our single sign-on login for Blackboard and all kinds of other systems at Seneca. And you can see that we have a form here that has a number of components. I have a place where I'm supposed to enter my email address, a place where I'm supposed to enter in my password, and a place where I can click and log in. So let's see how they've implemented this. So I'm interested in these controls here. And if I scroll up, I should be able to find the form. Here it is right here. Now, as you're looking at real HTML from random places on the web, what you're going to find is that there's going to be lots of complexity in it. And you might be tempted to say, I'm just going to give up. This is too complicated. Um, I don't understand it all. But I, I want you to get over th that feeling of not understanding everything and be willing to take a look and see what you can recognize it, that's in here. So here's our form. What do we see right away? Method equals post. Okay, so what do we have? Let's let's fix up this form. I'm going to do the same thing on mine over here. We'll strip away some of the complexity. Method equals post. So we have a form which is going to submit the data and it's not going to submit it in the URL. It's going to submit it in the body of the request. And probably it's doing this because we're sending a password and we don't want to have our password get exposed as plain text inside of the uh, the URL. So that's interesting. So what else do we have here? We have an ID on the element autocomplete equals off. Now this is something autocomplete equals off is something that's going to come up a lot. And what it means is we don't want the browser to automatically fill in you know, my email address or my password for me. I want to be able to do it on my own. So this is what it's saying. It's saying let the user let the user do this on their own. Some of this stuff I'm going to skip. They have a few event handlers here that we'll talk about when we, when we look at doing uh, validation later. But I'm interested in this action here. So what do we have? We have a big complex URL, but don't be intimidated by it because what it actually says is it says action equals slash ADFS slash LS slash and then it has a question mark and it has a whole bunch of data on the um, on the query string. So what we're saying is when we submit this form, we want to submit it to this location, ADFS slash LS. That's where the data is going to go. So when you click on sign in, the data that you type here, your username and password is going to get sent here. And they're also going to send a big chunk of data. You can see there's a big chunk of data that's on the query string of the URL that's going to get submitted. So they have already got a bunch of other data that you're not seeing, that you're not having to enter in the form. It's already been encoded for you, which is interesting. Okay, so we have a method, post, we have an action to a URL. What do we have inside here? We must have at least two input elements. So let's go looking for them. Um, okay, here's the first one right here. Input ID equals username input, name equals username. So you can see that the that the, imp, the ID and the name are not the same. So let's do the same thing here. Input and we want to say ID equals username input and name equals username. Now they use, they don't do text. So I want you to notice this. They don't use text, they use email. So one of the really cool things about these input elements is that there are all kinds of different styles or different types of input elements depending on the data that you're putting in there. So the problem, so text is like the most basic type. It means I can type any text and you'll just take this text and accept it. But if I'm, if I'm expecting my user to enter an email address, I should put email because the browser can do a little extra check for me to make sure that whatever the user puts in, is this a properly formatted email address? Or for example, I might say, I want the user to enter a telephone number. Well, 
I want the browser to help me out there, or I want to, I want the user to enter a URL. So there's all these different types. And what I'm going to use here is I'm going to say email because I want to make sure that the thing I get back is an email. Okay. What do they have that we recognize? So they have another placeholder placeholder is equal to, and you notice what they do here, someone at example.com. They're doing this because they're trying to give you an example of the kind of thing that they want you to type. So they want you to sign in with your Seneca email. We could probably make this even better. We could, we could probably say something like um, student at myseneca.ca or something like that. So we could give an even more specific example to show in our form to say, hey, this is the way that I want this to look. The last thing they do is they specify a bunch of things that they want to turn off. So you can see spell check equals false. They're telling the browser, don't bother trying to do spell checking on this field because when a person's entering their email address, it's almost always going to be a spelling mistake. We don't want to be told this is a spelling mistake. We don't want the browser to try and correct it for us. That's no good. What else do they have in here? Autocomplete equals off. They're saying we don't want the browser to fill this in automatically for you. These things are hints. So the browser is still going to make a choice and it may or may not honor what you put here as a developer, but at least it's, an, it's a way for you to specify and say, here's my intention. Here's what I would like to have happen. And sometimes it will work and sometimes it won't, depending on what the browser is configured to do. Sometimes a user will say, I don't want to share any of my data. Uh, and so the, even though you might say, I want autocomplete to work, the browser won't do it. Okay, so that's the first part is the person's email address. What else do we have? Let's inspect the second one here and see what we have. Okay, so the next thing they have is they have another input. ID equals password input name equals password. And now this is interesting, type equals password. Type equals password. Um, I'm just going to save my form so we can try this. So you can see here, when I type, you can see what I type. And you know what's going to happen here. When I type here, you can't see what I type. So the password type is really interesting because it allows me to type in text. I could have said text. Obviously, text would also work. But when I get here, people are going to be very surprised to see that their password is visible. So when they're sitting beside a friend and they're entering their password and all of a sudden it can be seen. So you want to make sure you're using a type which is going to mask the password. And depending on what kind of a device you're on, different things will happen. If you use a password field on a mobile device, browsers will typically show you the last letter you typed because it's more difficult to enter a password on those keyboards. So if you type an A, it'll show you an A and then it'll quickly switch to be a masked letter. You type the next letter. But when you're on a desktop browser, usually you won't see anything. So again, this is going to be up to the browser how they're going to do this. But this is this is what's going on in this case, but for when they're using a password. So this is a slightly more complex form because we have two pieces of data. We have a username and we have a password that we want to send and we want the user to enter those values. We want to post that data to the server and we want to post it to this URL. So this is where that data is going to get sent. And so on the server side, we can then determine, hey, are you who you say you are? Maybe that involves going and doing a database check or you know, somehow looking things up to make sure that um, everything is the way that it should be. OK, that's interesting. Um, let's look at another one. So here's a form that I know you've used. <laughs> so here's the Google homepage. And this is both a really simple form, but it's also somewhat complex in the way that they've built it. So I wanted to show you how they how they build their form because they're using standard HTML forms, but they're they're leveraging some things that are interesting for you to understand how they do it. So let's take a look. Here is, let's find our form. Um, here it is right here. Form starts right here. Okay. So 
what do we see? Let's try and recreate this form. So we have a form and it says class equals TF, TSF slash uh, space NJ. Don't worry about these short names. They just have a couple of classes. So class equals class one, class two. So they've got in their CSS, they're defining a couple of classes. For us, that doesn't really, we don't care about that right now. But the thing that we do care about is this action. Action equals slash search. This is exactly the same kind of thing that we saw Seneca doing. So it's interesting to see, interesting to see Google doing it too, where they're specifying this is, this is where I want to send my data. Okay, so how are they sending the data? Are they posting it or are they using a get? Now you'll see that if we keep going along here, they have method equals get. So we know method equals, they're up there, they're doing all uppercase. So you'll notice how some people do it lowercase, some people do it uppercase like Google, both ways will work. Method equals get, okay? They have some other stuff on here that's not really, uh, they have an ID for example, ID equals TSF and classes equals different classes. But the pieces that we really care about are the fact that we're gonna use slash search and we're going to do method equals get. So based on what we know, we should be able to go to slash search and it would it should show up. Now you'll notice that they have redirected us back again because we didn't put any data in here. But if I do if I do go to slash search, let me show you, I'll, I'll open up my network console here. Let me clear this so you can see it happen and I'll tell it to preserve the log. So I'm gonna do slash search and you'll see that what's happened here is I go to the search and the search has done a 302. 302 means it has redirected me back to this location here. So because I didn't enter any data, they there's nothing for them to do. So they're wanting me to finish entering my data so that um, they have something to search for. Okay, so let's dig into this form. So what do we have inside the form? So in the form, there has to be, um, this is the bottom of the form. So there must be the controls that I'm looking for. So we may have to dig inside of this to find them. And one trick we can use here is if we want to try and locate these, I might even just ask the console for it. So if I say selector all, and I might want to ask for all of the input controls. And there's nine input controls on this form. So if I move down through the list, you'll see that they pop up. So that one there is the Google search button. That one there is I'm feeling lucky. And these other ones, here's the one that I want right here. When I click on it, I can come over and I can inspect it. Okay, so the Google search form has input and what type of a search is this? Type equals text. That makes sense because you're typing in some piece of text here, uh, cat pictures, or whatever we want to search for. So <clears throat> we want to be able to type in text. Now, what else do they have? So an interesting thing that I see here is max length. So here's another thing for us to learn about. Google is saying that the longest that you can type in this text box are, it, it has to be under 2,048 characters in length. That's the most that they're going to accept when you type something in here and press enter. The reason they're doing that is because they're going to be processing that data on the URL as part of the query string and we're limited in how long we can make that data. So they're, they're proactively making sure that you don't enter too much data by setting a max length on that value. Okay, what else do we have? Name equals Q. So that's interesting. So that means that when we do a search, what, what we're really gonna do, like as an example, we're gonna do search Q equals, you know, cats or something like that. That's really what we're trying to produce here when we do our search. Uh, what else do we have? Lots of stuff uh, that we've that we've seen before. Auto capitalize equals off. Don't automatically change 
the capitalization of this uh, when I'm typing it. Autocomplete equals off. Autocorrect equals off. So don't change what the user puts in. And that again makes sense because think about doing a Google search so many times you're typing in very specific things and you don't want your browser to be helpful. I put um, I, I would put helpful in quotes. You don't want your browser to change the data that you are um, typing in. You want it to be exactly the way you typed it. Uppercase matters, lowercase matters. You don't want it to autocorrect and change all these different things. Okay, so what else do they have? They have title equals search. Well, this is interesting. So title equals search what is that title equals search if you hover your mouse over top of this you'll see how this just below my mouse there is a little pop-up that appears and it says search so often when we're building websites we want to make it easier for people to be able to say hey what is this what am i supposed to put here and that's what the title is for so title works actually it works on every element in uh, it's not specific to forms Okay, is that all we have here? No, that's not all we have here. We know from the console, we know that there's some other controls. So this, this button here, Google search, is actually an input control. So let's figure this out. Input, what do we have this time? Value equals Google search. Now that's interesting. Value equals Google search. And what's happening here is this is the text that's appearing for our button. Now, what makes it a button? Let's have a look through this. Name equals BTNK, like so. And type equals submit. So let me just save this so you can see what my form would look like here. So if I did this same thing on mine, you can see that I have the ability here. I can type in text. And here I have a button. If I click this button, it's going to try and submit the form for me. So it's a special kind of button. It's a submit button. And any number of submit buttons, can you can have them on a page. In fact, Google has two of them. Here's another one right down below. So they have another one. Input value equals I'm feeling lucky. Do you ever use the I'm feeling lucky button? I'm feeling lucky will return the first search result. I don't think I've ever used it. <laughs> it seems it's one of these uh, fun things that Google has maintained from its early days, which it'd be interesting to know what the statistics are on how many people use it. But BTNI type equals submit. So what we have here is we have a text box and we have two buttons. Let me just save my form. So we're going to have two buttons, a Google search button and an I'm feeling lucky button. And both of those buttons have a unique name. So this is how Google's going to know which button you clicked when you submit the form. It's going to submit whichever of these two buttons you clicked is going to be the one that's going to, um, the value is going to be set for that. So that's, that is interesting. Um, for this form, we have button types, we have text types. Now, Let's see what else we have in this page. Um, let's have a look at these other, let's take a look at some of these other ones. So if I, I wanna see what they have. Input, okay, now here's an interesting one. Input type equals hidden. So we have one, two, three, four hidden type equals hidden, input type equals hidden, like so. So this is sort of a, uh, an approximation of what the Google homepage is doing. What are these hidden things all about? Let's take this one right here. So name equals source, value equals HP, so what are they doing here? In our form, we have an input element here where I can type text and the name of it is Q and I can put up to 2048 characters in it. That's what this is. Then I have a submit button and I have another submit button. Now if I save, let's save this. Take a look at my form. 
you can't see these hidden elements, right? Because they are literally hidden. They're not meant for a user to enter the data. Instead, what we're doing is we are specifying a name and a value inside of our form. This is almost like when you go to a doctor's office or you go and you fill out some kind of a form. And on the form, it says, please fill out sections A, C, and D and leave section B. The office staff will fill out section B. So there's a portion of the form where you have name equals something, value equals something and as a developer you want to put extra data into the form but it's not really meant for the user to enter so for example what is google doing here google wants to record the fact that you came and did your search via their home page so the source the source of this search was from the home page google is really good at collecting data and figuring out okay when did this happen where did it happen and so on um, I've written something in the notes about what these other values might mean. Google doesn't necessarily talk about it, but lots of people will use this trick of putting in hidden values in order to be able to add more data to the form. Okay. All right, I have one last form for you that I want to show you today before I wrap up this segment, and it's a really different looking form. So here it is. When I get finished recording this video, I'm going to upload it to YouTube. And when I do, I'm going to go here and I can drag and drop my file into this form. Now, when you look at this, this does not look like a form. We don't have anywhere to enter text. It, it doesn't feel like any of the other forms that we have. So how, like, how is this a form? Let me prove it to you. So on this page, let's find the form. So I'm going to I'm going to say document.querySelector. Here it is right here. So there's a form in the page. And what about what if I asked for document.querySelector all input. I want to find all the input controls and there's actually three input controls on this page and you're like, well, where are they? I can't see any of them. So these input controls have been hidden. So let's let me let me show you. Here's one right here. Input type equals file. Let me make a let me do this over here so you can see an example. Input type equals file. So here's an example of what a file input looks like when I want to be able to choose a file to upload. I have a control on my page and it gives me a button that lets me choose a file from my file system. So YouTube is doing the exact same thing. What do they have? They have an input type equals file, name equals file data, and then they have this style. So take a look at this style. And based on what you know about CSS from the previous weeks of talking about CSS, what does this say? It says, basically, we want the height to be zero pixels and the width to be zero pixels, right? If you think about this and we want it to be display none, they don't want to show this. So let me prove it to you. Let me get rid of this. I'm just going to get rid of that and you'll see that it pops up right here in the DOM. So here it is down down below. So what YouTube is doing is they have this input control there for the form, but they hide it and they they're doing some fancy drag and drop coding and giving you the ability to click here or click here. And what it'll do when I click here is it'll trigger this same form. If I click on choose file, it works the identical way. So I have a form. It has a single con uh, input control in it and the type is a file control. So these controls are really powerful. They're gonna allow us to upload files, work with colors, work with numbers. In the, in the notes, let me, I guess I have the notes over here I could pull up. In the coming um, weeks, we're going to be working with forms and working with different types of forms, different input types. So what I'd love you to, for you to do is work through these notes and familiarize yourself with the kinds of input controls that we have, the sorts of properties that we have, things like autocomplete and some of these other things that we've been talking about in doing them. And I will do some more video examples showing you how to style your forms and connect them up to your data. But the best way, again, 
every time you're going around the web and you see a form, break open your dev tools and see how they built it. Are they using action? What's the URL that they're using? Are they specifying a method of post or get? How are they doing their input controls? What types of input controls are they using? You'll learn a lot from uh, going and looking at what other people do in their forms.